Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today we have I have the pr privilege uh, and the honor to moderate an exceptional panel on a crucial aspect of international security, nuclear proliferation, challenges, policies, and arms control regime. Uh, while the 10th review conference of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty has been postponed until August 2021, on Friday, the 22nd uh, of January, the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons entered into force. Uh, the agreement, ratified last October, is the world's most ambitious treaty on nuclear weapons yet. 86 nations have signed it and 51 uh, state parties have ratified it. But nuclear states uh, have refused to sign the treaty, preferring nuclear arms control treaties that they hope will eventually lead to the elimination of all weapons. And this exact topic of on nuclear proliferation is what we are going, we'll try to address today. So without any further ado, I uh, want to pass the floor to Deputy, uh, Deputy Minister of National Defense, General Alkibiadi Stefanis, with a huge experience on the field. He's an, the, an honorary chief of the Hellenic Army General Staff. So Minister, thank you uh, for come, being with us today. You have the floor for your opening comments. Thank you very much. Mr. President of the Department of International and European Studies of the University of Piraeus, dear professors, dear fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted and honored standing among you inaugurating this wonderful initiative. Being invited by academic institutions such as the University of Piraeus, one of the most prominent universities in the European Union, but also in Greece, it's always a pleasure and a unique experience. Today's event focuses on nuclear proliferation challenges, policies, and arms control. It is true that nuclear weapons have gone unused for nearly 75 years. Nonetheless, countries continue to spend vast sums of money on them, and nuclear proliferation dominates headlines. Major issues arise of the mass proliferation of nuclear weapons. Above all, stands that small powers have become owners of such weapons and the West is unable to understand their domestic policies, which have an intrinsic ability to surprise them. For decades, the United States led several initiatives in effort to reduce the role and the number of nuclear weapons. Among them is the 1991 Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, which set a ceiling of nuclear warheads and the new ones the 2002 Strategic Offensive Reduction Treaty, and the 2010 New START, which further lowered strategic nuclear levels. Political scientists like John Mersheimer, who belongs to the realistic school of thought, argued that, we, that in an anarchic world where states have offensive military capabilities and might have offensive intentions, they have no choice but to fear each other. On that context, Nuclear weapons proliferation is acceptable and the conventional wisdom about nuclear weapons is wrong. Someone would be extremely naive to believe that the transition from conventional warfare to nuclear warfare could, with relative ease, be managed and the nuclear escalation could then be controlled. This is definitely a dangerous assumption in such a multipolar nuclear world. Deterrence has helped keep peace among major powers for over seven decades. In fact, deterring aggression has become increasingly difficult and it stands to become more difficult still as a result of developments of both technological and geopolitical. The result is that the fight break between conventional and nuclear war is slowly disappearing with worrying implications for deterrence. The conclusion is what Andrew Krepinevich writes in his, in his article, The Eroding Balance of Terror, that the greatest strategic challenge of the current era is neither the return of great power struggle nor the spread of advanced weaponry. It is the decline of deterrence, closing with a certain belief that penetrating insights of the prominent speakers, but also the faculty which provide new and innovative ways to tackle the nuclear weapon proliferation I would like to leave the floor to the first speaker, 
Thank you very much all. Very glad to see you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thank Minister. Uh, so now I turn to our first speaker. Uh, we are waiting still with uh, for Mrs. Angela Kane. So we'll start uh, with uh, Mr. Levy. Uh, Ariel Levit is a non-resident senior fellow um, of the Nuclear Policy Program at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Prior to joining the Carnegie, uh, he was the principal deputy director general for policy at the Israeli Atomic Energy Commission from 2002 to 2007. He also served as the Deputy National Security Advisor for Defense Policy and was head of the Bureau of International Security and Arms Control in the Israeli Minister of Defense. Uh, Mr. Levit, it's a great, great pleasure and honor to have you with us. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marilena. It's um, wonderful to have this opportunity to address, uh, to address your audience in, in such a distinguished group. And to address a topic that uh, clearly is one that is worthy of considerable attention, I think the uh, words of the Deputy Minister were uh, sufficient to, um, to indicate that we're not just dealing here with just with a theoretical topic, but one that has profound security implications for uh, nations uh, more broadly and for nations in our part of the world in particular. So um, let me also, in the good tradition that it started, uh, provide a, a realist perspective on non-proliferation arms control, because I think that we have uh, enough of a track record uh, of arms control over more than a millennium to, to uh, think about those issues uh, um, and, and, and try and understand what is it that we're really seeing. So please, next slide. Okay, so... Um, I, I've promised Professor Platias that uh, I will use no acronyms except for one. Um, and then the one that I will be using is, is uh, as simply an acronym for non-proliferation arms control and disarmament. So, um, and uh, what I actually want to, to actually sh share with you um, is that there are lots of theories of what is it that we have actually drives arms control and non-proliferation and, and disarmament. There are clearly strategic considerations, there are clearly political drivers, both domestic and international, and economic incentives, institutional uh, desires to have arms control or to refrain from arms control, not in the least are moral, ethical, and legal issues, religious issues, and even issues of sustainability uh, on the, the environment. And together, in some fashion, they actually shape the non uh, the non proliferation arms control uh, and the Solomon agenda. Not always do we really understand from the people who address those issues, particularly in public and diplomatic settings, what are the real issues that are driving them, uh, and what is really shaping uh, the proposals they make. But I think that if we look at the history. And try to to um, to try and decipher what it actually uh, um, has to tell us. We could conclude uh, um, that there are some factors that are driving what we ultimately came to see as the agenda. So I would like to to do so by using a paradigm that I call the four P paradigm. Let's go to the next slide, and I will explain what I have in mind. So the 4P paradigm is about possession, possessor, projection, and proliferation. And what I would suggest to you is that ultimately the agenda is driven by a combination of focus on those four parameters. The possession is, <clears throat> uh, is, an, is essentially trying to connote the, the sense that the uh, motivation behind an effort to try and get arms control is the capacity of a certain capability, a certain type of arms or technology to inflict harm, be it physical harm or unleash uh, um, and, and negative dynamics. And that that uh, potential is inherent in the article of capability and it offsets uh, to uh, an important degrees its capacity to mitigate damages or diminish the prospects of a confrontation or escalation. So if uh, 
if we are encountering a situation where there is not clear that that is the case, that the capacity to, um, to um, inflict harm is, uh, um, is greater than the capacity to mitigate it, we typically get a paralysis according to this uh, uh, P. So an example would be uh, guns, where there is no arms control agreements on guns, or artillery, uh, uh, or tanks, uh, for that matter, and so on. There is hardly any arms control uh, pertaining to them. So that's the possession, namely the physical uh, capability. The possessor, uh, on the other hand, uh, turns the focus to um, the identity and characteristic of the nation or the sub-national entity, whoever, that possesses that capability and says that the, what matters is not the possession of the capability itself, be it nuclear weapons, conventional weapons, chemical weapons or whatever, but it's rather the identity of the possessor that makes it more or less worrisome for us to look at. And if the identity of the possessor suggests that it would be capabilities would be put to bad uses, then clearly there is an incentive to find a non-proliferation uh, um, uh, option to try and deny him uh, or her or whatever that capability, or if that fails, at least engage them in arms control uh, arrangement that would in some ways limit um, the uh, employment of those capabilities. The third type of focus is talking about the projection. And what I mean by projection is that uh, uh, the attention now focuses not on the possessor, not on the possession, but rather the, the, the um, doctrine for the use uh, that governs uh, employment of those assets that affects the context in which it might be used, the rules of engagement, the timing of the use and so on. Now, clearly there are some connections between the possessor and the projection, but nevertheless, a lot of the arms control arrangements actually pertain to the projection, first use, for example, uh, and so on, as distinguished from either the possessor or the possession. And the final uh, category uh, um, that I, I, I propose to, to, uh, for you to consider is where you're not looking primarily either at the possession or the possessor or even at the projection, but rather whether the capability that is currently in the hands uh, of certain entities would actually be shared with others or propel others to acquire them or of, sec of setting capabilities if facing, if they are facing uh, such a prospect that the um, that someone would actually have them, so the concern would not be with the possession, the projection, or the possessor. It would be the, by the prospects that those would spread further to others, who might then be a serious cause of concern. And my core argument is that historically, there has been a lot of rhetoric and diplomatic rituals. Marilena has just mentioned, and properly so, one current example, the Treaty for Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which focuses on the possession, which focuses on the, on the weapons themselves. But not with storing the rhetoric and the diplomatic rituals, as Marilena has again uh, uh, stressed, none of the major powers that possess nuclear weapons have actually subscribed to that treaty. So the issue therefore is that real arms control or real sort of uh, um, um, disarmament is not fundamentally uh, about the weapons themselves in most cases, but it's rather uh, more with the possessors The argument is that we're focusing predominantly on the last three Ps, even if the rhetoric and the diplomacy focus on the on the first one. That is uh, um, that is my principal argument, and I would argue that this argument manifests itself in in um, uh, um, in both considerations of both stability and sustainability. Sustainability being if the, the, the capabilities were being used, would they in fundamental ways affect our capacity, for example, to continue to live in this world uh, safely? 
let me let's uh, move on. So with this paradigm in front of you, the next slide, please. Let's focus on a few examples. The examples are principally designed to illustrate to you what I have in mind. So uh, I've already alluded to the um, to the case where the five the um, there is a uh, five nuclear legitimate quote unquote nuclear uh, weapons uh, holders, but in fact the list is not confined to five, and the one that comes closest to this list of five is India, where through agreements that were negotiated uh, with India in the 2000s. India was de facto, not the euro, but de facto accepted as member of this club. Whereas North Korea, Iran, Libya, and Pakistan are not. So it's not the possession itself, it's not the nuclear weapons themselves that have been the concern, but it's some combination of the other three Ps. And in the Indian case in particular, the idea was that the possessor is actually reassuring that he would be behaving in ways that are very similar uh, um, to the ways the other nuclear powers are as distinguished from the ways that Pakistan is suspected to contemplate using nuclear weapons, which is quite early on and in a rather uh, a reckless manner. The debate that is going on around the DPRK is be precisely because the DPRK wishes to accept to, to um, have others accept its uh, a similar status, accorded a similar status, and clearly there is no confidence that that's the way uh, um, the DPRK would behave. It, a sort of a similar illustration pertains to Iran and its nuclear ambitions, <clears throat> where the fear is like in the case of, of the DPRK, that the identity of the possessor is not inspiring not inspiring because of the nature of the regime, not inspiring because of the likelihood that they, would, they might actually use it to no good, and not inspiring because if the uh, Iranians do acquire nuclear weapons, it's quite likely to unleash a dynamics where others who have thus far uh, held back from acquiring nuclear weapons would do so, and we will get to a particular case in point in, in a few minutes. Syria possessed chemical weapons for a long, long time. And although the regime was not a friendly regime or a democratic regime and so on, uh, the world, including um, both uh, Syria's allies and adversaries, put up with that possession. With that, uh, possession. So it wasn't the identity of the possessor as such, nor was it chemical weapons as such that uh, provided the trigger to try and disarm Syria of chemical weapons. It was the fact that Syria had used the weapons against Syria that had triggered the agreement to force Syria to give it up uh, on the arsenal and to force it to accede to the Chemicals Weapons Convention, which was brokered uh, um, between Russia and the United States, forcing basically Syria to do so. And by the way, the Syrians kept on cheating on this agreement and kept on using albeit capable on using chemical weapons, albeit on a much uh, smaller scale. Marilena had talked about the Treaty of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons uh, and so on. And once again, the fact that it's rejected by the P5 um, um, uh, is clearly uh, um, uh, illustrating to you that, that in this particular case, is actually reassuring and that the bets associated with the continued acquisition of uh, nuclear weapons by those P5 uh, not only should be considered as, as, um, um, as something which is tolerable, but in fact, may, for many countries, it's actually reassuring because they rely on the um, collective security guarantees issued by those P5 uh, um, possessors and so on. And the sense that those uh, P5 are actually strongly committed not to share those capabilities. On the flip side, clearly there is a, a broad consensus that non-state actors do possess uh, um, um, serious uh, um, potential 
not only to use recklessly such capabilities, but also to proliferate them and so on, which is why there is a consensus to try and deprive them of, of those capabilities, which is also manifest in treaties. Um, the Biological Weapons Convention and eventually the Chemical Weapons Convention came closest to uh, treaties which seemed on the face of it to suggest that these categories of weapons were thought to be ones where the possession itself was, being, was a problem uh, and therefore should be banned uh, outright. But in fact, the progress that was accomplished on the Biological Weapons Convention and eventually the Chemical Weapons Convention was only uh, uh, made once concerns abounded that they would not be uh, in the hands of the superpowers, but they would be had that in, many, in the hands of many others who would be less timid in their uh, use. Although the arsenals were clearly the largest initially uh, the largest in the hands of the Soviet Union and the United States. And finally, <clears throat> um, there is um, uh, uh, the experience of failures to get arms control in imposing controls on certain categories of arms, ballistic missiles, missile defense, space, cyber, uh, and so on, which is uh, only illustrating <clears throat> That, um, the, um, that there the international community is not convinced that depriving uh, the world of those capabilities uh, in a universal and non-discriminatory fashion would actually make the world into a safer place. And so uh, as a result, uh, um, you can actually uh, uh, see that this reinforces the message that I was trying to communicate to you Namely, that what we are really seeing uh, uh, are the four drivers of those considerations in the interplay between them, shaping what ultimately produces agreements uh, on arms control or fails uh, to produce them. And I think the case of, of um, um, the case is, is um, um, uh, further illustrated by where there is an effort directed, for example, the ROK in Japan, where the, the biggest concern is about the proliferation rather than, than the, um, uh, the weapons themselves. Uh, let's, uh, let me conclude uh, by the next, on the next slide by looking at the specific um, case, which might be quite uh, close to your hearts. Um, I uh, was making a very strong case why uh, uh, the focus is um, typically not at the weapons themselves, but rather the possessor. President Erdogan, not surprisingly, is actually protesting the nuclear order as discriminatory. Namely, he points to the fact that it's not universal in its uh, adherence. The remarkable aspect is that President Erdogan is doing so um, and further, going further and warning that Turkey might, under some circumstances, acquire nuclear weapons, for example, if Iran dies, <clears throat> or if the treaty on the non proliferation treaty remains unchanged. And yet, the same President Erdogan continues to enjoy and insist that the US keep nuclear weapons on its soils, keeps on enjoying NATO Article 5 assurances. And all of this against extremely intimate relationship between Turkey and Pakistan that has uh, been further reinforced in recent years. But in the, in the, um, uh, for people who have a little bit of a longer history might also recall that Turkey was an important part of the uh, AQ Khan network. That's the famous Pakistani scientist who was selling uh, nuclear technology, nuclear weapons production technology from Pakistan in order to modernize the um, um, Pakistani nuclear pursuits. And, um, and uh, Turkey was playing a quite an active role in the export and import of the AQ Khan uh, network. So I, I think that that uh, tells you something about the role of Turkey in the proliferation aspects, but also tells you something about <clears throat> the strategy that Turkey is pursuing 
with respect, with respect to the nuclear issue. So if we need to figure out in light of the insights that I try to share with you, what should one focus on this case? The fact that nuclear weapons have de facto been accepted um, reluctantly, but nevertheless accepted as legitimate and so on, in which case we shouldn't be bothered if Turkey accepts them. Should we be bothered primarily by the fact that it's Turkey and its behavior has not been and my, or might not be particularly reassuring if it lays its hand on nuclear weapons and so on, be it because of the dynamics it unleashes, the likelihood of use that it would make of them, use being in the sense of um, uh, feeling a cover to pursue other ambitions that it has or use in terms of actually using it, namely the projection of it. And might Turkey also share some of its capabilities or some parts thereof as, as something that is already done even before it had nuclear weapons in the context of the um, AQ Khan network and so on. So I leave you uh, to make your own conclusion of this analysis. But what I would say is <clears throat> that on the one hand, uh, you can clearly see the struggle between this anxiety about the most explosive uh, uh, and, and uh, potentially destructive uh, nuclear uh, sort of weapons of the world on the one hand, and the anxiety about uh, the possession, projection, and proliferation of those capabilities, particularly in certain hands, and so on, and where Turkey fits into that equation. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. It was uh, it was great, and your model with the four Ps uh, helped us make sense of a very very complicated reality. Uh, I want to welcome our second speaker, Mrs. Angela Kane. Uh, welcome, uh, Mrs. Kane. Uh, Mrs. Kane uh, was formerly the UN High Representative for Disarmament Affairs and then the Secretary General for Management in the United Nations from uh, 2012 to 2015. Uh, as of uh, 2016, Mrs. Kane teaches at uh, Sciences Po uh, in Paris and School of International Affairs on disarmament issues, and she also teaches at Tsinghua University as of 2019. Uh, she is the uh, senior fellow at the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation and the vice president of International Institute for Peace in Vienna. And I stop here because I could continue <laughs> for hours. So Mrs. Kane, it, uh, we are delighted to have you with us. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Marina. And thank you very much, Athanasios, for organizing this from the University of, uh, of Piraeus. And thank you, Eli, also for starting off. Uh, and uh, Vasilis, thank you for organizing all of this. Uh, of course, first of all, happy International Women's Day. I think today everything is on international women. So all of a sudden we're having nuclear proliferation, which is quite a different uh, topic. And you've mentioned that I have been at the UN for a long time. So I want to go back a little bit and cast the net a little bit wider and look at the uh, United Nations first and then come to the current challenges and what we're facing that uh, Ili has already talked about. And you know that disarmament and the regulation of armaments were really the uh, two key mandates of the UN and the very first resolution that the UN ever adopted in January 1946 uh, was really to adopt the mandate to pursue the elimination of nuclear weapons. And I mentioned nuclear weapons because that was of course very shortly after the explosion of the nuclear bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki and they said nuclear weapons and all other weapons quote adaptable to mass uh, destruction and the resolution which is interesting distinguished between disarmament meaning the total elimination of weapons of mass destruction and the regulation of conventional uh, armaments and the membership at that time, of course, the UN only had 54 members at that time, envisaged that these two mandates were really complementary and were to be pursued simultaneously and not sequentially. And that's really very important because they also made it equally clear that nuclear weapons were to be eliminated. It did not see them as being subject to limitation or to regulation. And in view of the importance given to nuclear disarmament at the very beginning, uh, of the United Nations, some wonder why does the charter not have any reference to nuclear weapons? And that is of course, because the uh, charter was drafted and signed before 
actually the nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, were tested. And this is why the chart is very often called a pre-atomic uh, document. Then it's also not surprising that the charter didn't assign any specific uh, tasks or functions to the secretary general uh, in this field because the general the assembly was to debate the principles of disarmament and make recommendation and the security council was given the authority to develop plans for the regulation of armaments and the military staff committee, which was created at the same time, had the mandate to advise the Security Council on matters relating to disarmament and the regulation of armaments. Now, the attention paid by the secretaries general over the years has fluctuated um, because uh, the, the uh, most active in disarmament was undoubtedly uh, Secretary General Doug Hammarskjöld. Uh, who in 1955 called disarmament a hardy perennial. I think it's a wonderful expression, a hardy perennial. And this is a term that he repeatedly used while he was in office. And he viewed the relationship between disarmament and peace as mutually reinforcing. And he said in 1956, and I quote, the disarmament is never the result only of the political situation. It is also partly instrumental in creating the political situation. Now, what are the recent steps by the UN on disarmament? The recent initiative in 2018 actually was from Secretary General Antonio Guterres, and he issued a blueprint and it was called Securing Our Common Future, uh, an agenda for disarmament. And he had basically set out a new disarmament approach and sort of set disarmament to save humanity, to save lives, for future generations and strengthening partnerships for disarmament. You'll find very little, which I find interesting on nuclear disarmament in there or even nuclear arms control in there. It's something that is not emphasized at all in this, in this blueprint. But this was the first time a secretary general set out a comprehensive agenda and by which he hoped to reinvigorate dialogue. And I think as you will know, 2018 Trump administration, it was very dire straits and therefore he wanted to make it disarmament into the priorities of the entire UN system. And uh, he's basically urged people to change the course of events. But on the other hand, as we all know, the Secretary General and the Secretariat can assist member states. They can advocate, they can nudge, they can urge, but the agreement to take concrete steps uh, is always the sole prerogative of the member states to conclude treaties and they view disarmament, both serving their self-interests and also their aspirations. And this has become very starkly apparent in the last few years when the views on nuclear disarmament diverged, diverged even further. So how did arms control become an integral part of the global security architecture? It was considered important because people understood that the alternative was really unimaginable. The arms controllers of the past came from a generation that remembered the Cuban Missile Crisis and following this watershed moment in 1962, arms control and disarmament treaties were concluded in swift order, including the foundational treaty on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. So where are we today? The fears expressed by President Kennedy at the time in the early 60s, uh, that he said the proliferation chain, we could end up with 25 to 30 nuclear powers and that, unfortunate, that fortunately did not materialize. And the five nuclear weapon states in the NPT, as we all know, are China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the US, while the four nuclear possessor states outside the NPT are India, Israel, North Korea, and Pakistan. None of the four, as I mentioned, joined the NPT. North Korea left the NPT in 2003. But if you look at the actual listing who is a member or a state's party, it still is listed as a state's party because um, it, it's an interesting justification because the NPT was extended indefinitely in 1995 and therefore it's considered to be no longer possible to exit the treaty despite the treaty provisions to the, to the contrary. Uh, by all accounts, the NPT has been very successful with 191 states being party to it. And yet, here we are 50 years later, or 51 by now, uh, and uh, the promise made by the nuclear weapon states in Article 6, a very short article, is still unfulfilled. And that article reads, each of the parties to the treaty undertakes to pursue negotiations in good faith 
on effective measures relating to the cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date and to nuclear disarmament and on a treaty on general and complete disarmament under strict and effective international control. So what have we seen? We have seen the number of nuclear weapons come down from about 70,000 during the Cold War period to some 12,000 today, the majority of which are being held by the US and Russia. Uh, but on the other hand, stasis has set in. No further reductions are planned. Instead, we are seeing significant increases in military budgets and upgrading of military hardware. And while the abrogation of President Trump of New START, JCPOA, Open Skies, the arms control architecture of previous decades was clearly collapsing. There was a sigh of relief when US President Biden extended New START immediately upon assuming office in January, but we're still very far away from a strategically stable arms control situation. New START, as we recall, was concluded 10 years ago. Extending it has given us a time window of five years, but no negotiations are underway, or even, to my knowledge, being discussed. The Biden team is barely complete. The experience of previous negotiators is lost by now. It takes years to negotiate a new treaty. Will five years be enough to include a new Russian-US bilateral treaty? But let us also reflect upon how the world has changed since New START was negotiated. We are now in a multipolar world order. The US is no longer the sole global leader. Russia has become more assertive and China has risen as a major geopolitical power at eye level with the United States. And China has traditionally kept a very low profile on arms control matters, but it has embarked on a military spending spree which enabled it to modernize and expand its nuclear delivery systems, as well as purchase military hardware and multiply, and that's very important, its conventional missile inventory. Global defense spending, let us recall, increased last year to $1.83 trillion. And that means a growth of 3.9% in real terms. China's defense budget grew by over 5% in 2020 to $12 billion. And that's larger than the combined defense budget increases in all other Asian states. And to give you a final statistics, only five countries, and that's US, China, India, Russia, and Saudi Arabia, accounted for 63% of global military spending in 2019. Five countries, 63%. Transforming New START into a trilateral agreement as demanded by the Trump administration was roundly rejected by China. And it is really unclear what inducements could be offered to bring China to the table. As of now, there does not appear to be a roadmap for including China in trilateral discussions. Menacing or trying to blackmail China clearly is counterproductive, yet the Trump administration was correct in that the bilateral arms control model is outdated and China's enhanced geopolitical stature should also be reflected in assuming a higher profile in arms control matters. So what could, we, what could be done to get China to the table, to take its seat at the table? I, take the, I see six difficulties. One, China believes that the onus is on Russia and the US to deliver. Both have huge nuclear arsenals dwarfing the other nuclear powers. Second, appealing to China's wish to be considered a major military power on par with the US would, in my opinion, not be successful. It's not enough of an enticement. Third, China needs to become much more transparent. Very little is known about its military deployment and stance, but China resists transparency as it fears this could be used to facilitate attacks on its territory. And fourth, China has no experience in military and or nuclear negotiations. It has no experience in verification, in military to military contacts, in joint exercises, and this is a significant drawback. The experience of the US, Soviet Union, Russia goes back to President Kennedy and Cuba crisis, 60 years of continuous engagement with each other. And fifth, what it also needs to be considered is the issue of nuclear sharing. 
And that is not only a US-Europe issue. China has always pointed at the US, had always pointed the finger at the US deploying their nuclear weapons, not only in Europe, but also in Asia. And that is a major part of their concern. The US on its part draws the attention to China's superiority in missiles, weapons that they feel must now be included in the negotiations. And six and last, there's a fundamental difference in what is the prerequisite for success. The two countries have to reach a shared understanding what arms control is really possible. Because tension between US and China revolves not only around nuclear weapons, but around intense conventional military competition. Territorial disputes to acquire military superiority over the US and its allies, Japan and South Korea. Both countries need to ensure that this competition remains under control and does not become more threatening and also more costly. Now, new challenges have emerged and I want to spend a little bit of time on that. And they have really arisen in recent years. In addition to geopolitical considerations, these new challenges, technological challenges, pose challenges to arms control and the global security landscape. The emergence of offensive cyber capabilities in statecraft has raised disturbing questions about cyber, a cyber war, and what that could mean. How to ward off threats to nuclear command, control, and communication systems. Rapid advances in technologies have raised ethical, legal, and non-proliferation challenges. Drones have become more sophisticated with advanced technology and lethal autonomous weapon systems or laws are another example of enabling new weapon technology. Boots on the ground is very much the exception than the rule. And it's usually the civilians that are put into harm's way. It has become clear that the trend towards increasing autonomy in military systems will continue and that it will affect all domains of warfare. Not only sophisticated drones of law, but laser weapons, hypersonic missiles, stealth airplanes, and whatever else is in production or development. It's all very worrisome. Technological superiority is likely to decide who is going to win on the battlefield. Robots do not get tired. They do not get influenced by emotions or by stress. What is worrisome to me in this context is the fact that there are no rules there are no norms of deployment of such instruments or weapons, and there's resistance by some states to engage in negotiations to develop guidance and rules to address the regulatory and normative shortcomings. The chorus of voices of states, amplified by very vigorous civil society campaigns, is, however, getting stronger every year. 30 countries now want an outright ban on lethal autonomous weapon systems. Pope Francis, UN Secretary General Guterres, the European Parliament, 26 Nobel Peace Prize laureates, over 110 NGOs, 4,500 artificial intelligence experts, and I also must mention that 61% of the public have raised their voices against them. And the International Committee of the Red Cross has campaigned to outlaw them very vigorously. The question is, how long will it take before negotiations for a ban treaty begin. The talks on law started in 2014, seven years ago in Geneva. The progress has been glacial and is now subject to consensus in a group of governmental experts. But let me return to the issue of nuclear weapons. 20 years into the new century and 50 years since it entered into force, the NPT has lost its luster. It enshrined the nuclear status of five countries and denied any other party to the treaty to ever acquire nuclear weapons. The exceptions are the four countries outside the NPT, which I had mentioned earlier. The recognition of this double standard has long dodged the NPT deliberations. Stalemate in implementing accords and agendas, agreed in NPT review conferences, which are held every five years and by consensus, led in 2017 to the adoption of a new instrument, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW, which now has 86 signatories and 54 states parties, and that came into force uh, in January of this year. The dismissal by the, 
of the TPNW by the five nuclear weapon states and those under the nuclear protection is unfortunate and very short-sighted. Now nuclear weapons are illegal, declared Beatrice Finn, the executive director of ICANN, which is a coalition of 607 NGOs and which received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. The TPNW, in my opinion, has been a seismic shift, not one that will immediately change the nuclear landscape by reducing the number of nuclear weapons, but one that is strongly strengthening the norm against nuclear weapons. It is also chipping away at the bulwark of nuclear weapons deterrence theories and the threat that nuclear proliferation is just around the corner. Several of the countries opposed to the TPNW, especially here in Europe, have constituencies that are against nuclear weapons. The Netherlands, a strong supporter of NATO and the Nuclear Alliance, was forced by public pressure to participate in the TPNW negotiations in 2017, but it voted against the treaty in the end. A poll conducted in Europe in late 2019 showed that 80% of the millennials considered the existence of nuclear weapons a threat to humanity. And that's clearly a space that we need to watch. The debate about the TPNW has underlined the fact that five possessors of nuclear weapons are unwilling to give them up. Even reducing the number of nuclear weapons seems to be a no-go. That poses the question, are the states which have agreed not to acquire nuclear weapons doomed to live under a nuclear hegemony forever? The answer was clearly the TPNW, the final step in forcing the nuclear powers to commit to Article 6 of the NPT. Now, what does the future look like? What can be done in advance of the NPT review conference that has now been postponed to August from last year? The time should be really employed to conduct a dialogue, to find common ground, to explore a way forward. The election of President Biden has clearly improved the diplomatic atmosphere. It is time to think about arms control agreement. And I've already mentioned that the public view of, of, uh, of population, particularly about youth is negative. People don't feel secure with nuclear weapons anymore. They reject their existence, they reject the high cost, and they also reject the environmental degradation they cause. It's clear but what we need is a new vision for arms control and one that goes beyond counting inventories, goes beyond upgrading nuclear weapons technology. A more holistic approach is needed to take account of geopolitical changes, of the rise of new technology, of the way that war fighting has really changed. But the time should also be spent on thinking about the work and the aims of the NPT review process, despite various changes made by consensus during previous review conferences sessions, the implementation has lacked or not been fulfilled. It's not enough to dismiss previous agreements as outdated, a view that only few states hold, so it needs a serious effort to find common ground on a way forward. Only a willingness to respect each other's views can help agree on mutually acceptable outcomes. Practical steps should be explored that would be seen as fostering goodwill, and I just want to name a few. One is to freeze the existing arsenals and fissile material stockpile. Two, to agree on a multilateral agreement on no first use of nuclear weapons. Three, to secure ratifications to get the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty into force. Four, for Russia and US to re-engage in a disarmament negotiating process. Five, to ban the introduction of new and destabilizing types of nuclear weapons, and lastly, to conclude legally binding commitments to not target or threaten non-nuclear weapon states. And there are also three additional steps, in my opinion, that should be considered ahead of the NPT conference in August. The three depository states of the NPT, and that is Russia, the UK, and the US, hold a special responsibility for the NPT, and they need to facilitate a constructive P5 relationship with the rest of the membership. It seems to me that the views have been static for such a long time. It is no longer enough to repeat the mantra that the NPT is the cornerstone of proliferation. We've all heard that ad nauseum, but it's a statement that leaves out the disarmament part. It is also important to recall previous commitments. How about the three depository states appointing a special coordinator to contribute to creating the environment for the establishment of the Middle East 
uh, Weapons of Mass Destruction Free Zone, with the 2015 NPT review conference ending without a consensus final document, they seem to have shrugged off their responsibility for this issue, but it is long festering and offering such a step would help in smoothing over some rough waters. Lastly, another positive signal would be set if the P5 and those under the nuclear umbrella would attend the first conference of states parties of the TPNW as observers. Such a meeting has to be held by January next year within the first 12 months of it coming into force. And attendance would at a minimum indicate respect for differing positions on nuclear weapons possession. What is at stake really goes beyond the NPT. Nuclear arms control issues are foremost in our minds, but there are other challenges to the global security landscape. I think we are in for a rough ride. It's not only a matter of putting on our seat belts on, but on coming together on helping to overcome the current impasse. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Angela. It's, uh, it, it was really very interesting. You gave us the overview of the situation. And I just want to uh, keep one sentence. We are far from a strategically stable situation. So now I would like to turn to our two commentators. Uh, first of all, uh, my good friend, the Professor Athanasius Platias, um, uh, Professor Platias, a professor of strategy at the University of Piraeus, an expert on this issue. So Athanasius, please, the floor is yours. First of all, I would like to thank the two speakers for delivering fascinating talks. Uh, and, uh, I will have just brief comments and questions to both our speakers. Let me start with uh, Angela. Uh, she mentioned the, some of the problems of the arms control regime and especially the non-proliferation regime. Uh, let me highlight a different aspect of a problem of the non-proliferation regime. The emphasis was on the technological denial but if you see why states go nuclear, usually go for security reasons. And let's look one security challenge that we are having with the rise of China. Uh, it threatens its neighbors like Korea, Japan, India, another nuclear country that actually last year they were in conventional conflict, uh, Australia, and why these countries, they haven't gone nuclear, although most of them, they do have the technological capability. It was because the United States provided security guarantees and make them feel secure. Now we are in a situation that China is rising and there are doubts about the commitment of the United States to provide uh, security guarantees to countries like Japan. Uh, this was apparent, or Korea, that, uh, or even Taiwan. And that was apparent during the Trump administration. Uh, an argument can be made that things have changed with Biden. But, you know, four years ago, uh, four years later, Trump may be back in power. So countries start doubting about the credibility of American insurances. And then China is rising and, uh, and, and creating geopolitical challenges of all these countries. So th this is a kind of mix that, to my mind, uh, creates strong proliferation uh, imperatives. And the strategy of technological denial cannot work because all the countries that I have mentioned, from Japan to Taiwan to Korea, they do have the technological capability. So how the international community uh, Angela ca ca can deal with this problem of the rising China and the security that it's uh, spreading around given uncertainties about the United States role. Do you want me to answer? 
Yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. I think that is very, those are very valid points that, uh, that you raised. And uh, in essence, uh, what it is, is that uh, the uh, nuclear security umbrella that was extended by the United States has held up for an awfully long time really well. Uh, what has always been in existence is also, of course, the deterrence. You know, this has really worked because it's deterred others from acquiring a nuclear weapons because we have the NPT and also because they have not been wanted to be attacked by a nuclear weapon. I think that with the technological developments of the last year, so let's say the last decade, the last 15 years, this argument has really gone out with the window because it is a very blunt instrument. If you want to detonate a nuclear bomb, you are using a basically a sledgehammer for something that might just need a little tap. And so uh, there is the question, what would you actually do? Would you actually use a nuclear weapon? The only way that a nuclear threat is, is effective is if people think you're going to use it. Now with China, China is the only of the nuclear weapon states that has said it will never be the first to use uh, a nuclear weapon. It will retaliate if it is attacked with a nuclear weapon, but it will not be the first to have a nuclear weapon. And that is very important because none of the other nuclear powers have actually said they would. What I find very <clears throat> difficult is that um, uh, if you have, for example, under Trump in the nuclear posture review, which uh, he developed in 2018, um, he actually thought that he actually proposed in the posture review that there should be smaller, more usable nuclear, nuclear bombs. And that, to my mind, is really dangerous because what it means is it's like a little mini bomb that you can explode, uh, explode and it has a less uh, devastating effect because it is in a smaller contained level. The whole effort began about the TPNW because of the humanitarian consequences. And what, quest what questions were raised was if a nuclear bomb indeed was detonated, who would take care of the population? Who would take care of the consequences environmentally, uh, medically, anything? And that is an answer that no one could answer and that basically led to the fact to, for states to say, this is not a safe weapon. This is not something that we want to employ. That is not something that we want detonated, particularly if you think about that the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki were very small compared to what you have now. But uh, on the other hand, what has happened in the last 10, 15 years is that you have technological developments, and some of them I mentioned, where conventional weapons are basically equaling and are much more effective weapons than nuclear weapons. And so therefore, do we really need nuclear weapons? And the last point that I want to make is that you have countries that are nuclear possessors, and you mentioned India, you mentioned you know, Pakistan. India and China had as border skirmishes you know, along their border. I find this extremely disconcerting. I also do not find, India always said, we are responsible. That's what they say always. We are a responsible nuclear power. Excuse me, you know, this is not really a very, stable country in some aspects. There are developments politically in India that I find very much of concern. It's a huge country and I don't think that everyone has that under control. And the other problem is with, uh, with Pakistan, they've just had skirmishes again about uh, Kashmir. And I find that the military, if it is in charge, can you really be sure that they're not going to go the ultimate step forward and use a nuclear weapon? So I think that the world in general is better off not to have a nuclear weapon, particularly, or let's say, let's take a first step, but you don't have still 12,000 nuclear weapons. What do you need that for? 6,000 US, 6,000 Russia, you know, at least in the last 10 years after New START, nothing has been happened to bring down the numbers even further. They could be easily, at least it would set a signal that this is no longer, um, you know, like, like the main reliance on, 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 uh, on, on, a, on a war fighting capability. Instead, what you have is you have an upgrading of all of these weapons. That's why you need so much money. And that to my mind is very much a concern. And the other issue, let me also bring this in. And I find it interesting because uh, Ili already talked about Turkey and President Erdogan at the General Assembly in, um, in, in New York, you know, talking about uh, the, you know, the, the nuclear weapons and basically the discrepancy that comes in with the nuclear possessors. NATO continues to be a nuclear alliance, and they say this at every turn of the screw, is NATO is a nuclear alliance. I mean, is that, you know, really that everyone signs, signs up on you? 
So I find this, I find this a discussion that needs to be had, but the nuclear powers do not want to have that discussion. And that to my mind is a mistake because it's going to come somehow, I don't wanna say it's gonna be a clash, but it's unless it is well prepared to have the um, uh, NPT review conference in August, I really foresee that there are grave problems coming down the pike. Absolutely, I agree with you. Oh, and let me now turn to uh, Dr. Levite. Uh, Eli, you know, the framework that you presented, it's really fascinating and solves one big problem in the literature. I mean, why different countries have been treated differently, either from US allies like France, Taiwan, uh, uh, Korea, Pakistan, and Israel, they were treated differently when they tried to get nuclear weapons or, or enemies of the United States, like Iraq, Iran, North Korea, Libya. So uh, one of the questions was how to explain this discrepancy and different policies. And I think your, fr your framework uh, has given a wonderful realist explanation compared to other kinds of explanations that we were trying through domestic politics to, uh, to, to understand these different strategies. So uh, it's really fascinating uh, to listen to this realist framework. Now, let me turn to my question. 30 years ago, all the predictions about nuclear proliferation, uh, we're talking about 30, 40 nuclear powers. We have only nine. Is this a success? or it's something funny happening that really the discussion is not having or not having nuclear weapons, but adopting a strategy in between the nuclear option or nuclear hedging. So oh, we may don't see right now 30 or 40 nuclear powers, but we may have 30 or 40 nuclear powers that are capable in very, so, uh, capable in very short time to turn nuclear. Would you agree with that? Well, let me start by, by commenting on the four themes that I've heard from um, Angela Kane that I thought were quite striking and which I think would, would lead to the answer uh, and so on. First of all, I think one cannot but admire the conviction of those who are worried about the state of the affairs and the potential damage that nuclear weapons could do, uh, particularly if in the wrong hands but uh, obviously there is the potential of accidents and so on. Number two, we're in total agreement that there is a growing gap between, you know, the, the, uh, the situation, the, the worrisome aspects of the situation on the one hand and the inability of the arms control uh, uh, frameworks to actually tackle any of those issues because China is out, because the other P5 are not willing to give up. And we can go on and on because the others are not willing to engage because the US Congress isn't willing to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. We can go on and on with the particularistic risks and so on, but I don't think there is any disagreement that there is a yawning gap between the, the concerns expressed and the status of the platform of arms control, the, the denuclearization and so on. No disagreements whatsoever. Nor can we disagree that nuclear weapons are the most powerful category of, of, of weapons available. Uh, uh, um, by mankind and, and, and so on, humankind, sorry. Where I think my answer to you uh, and my some of my disagreement with Angela Kane uh, comes, and, and it's a respectful disagreement, is that I think that something fundamental about the nature of nuclear weapons has not been absorbed and continues to, to um, drive the efforts to try and, and, and rid the world of nuclear weapons which I support, provided it can be done and make the world a safer place. I would argue that the only reason that Pakistan and India are not at war is because they both possess nuclear weapons. And God help us if neither of them, if, if, if one of them or both of them would not have had nuclear weapons under the current situation. When the Indians were reacting to different Iranian-Pakistani provocations the other way around, what prevented them from going to war was the, uh, the, the sobering realization that if they go to war, nuclear weapons were going to be used. And that would be the end of, uh, of things as we knew them on the subcontinent and a lot more worse than, than beyond. 
So that's one aspect of why I think one has to understand that nuclear weapons, and because they're so scary, have also performed a certain role. Nuclear weapons have also provided a recipe for restraint in conventional armaments that otherwise would not have existed. Nuclear weapons have allowed the United States to project security guarantees to its allies, even when its new it, conventional capabilities to actually defend them leave a great deal to be desired. Because their adversaries had to factor in the possibility that at the end of the day, in extremists, can we doubt for a, even a second that China cannot take over conventionally uh, Taiwan? Does anyone in his right mind believe that the Taiwanese conventional capabilities can stand up to an effort of China 10 years ago? But certainly today, with all they have next to Taiwan and the modernization that the PLA had undergone, what keeps Taiwan safe at the end of the day are two things, that they have a declared independence on the one hand, and that there is the US nuclear security guarantee predicated on the avail availability of nuclear weapons. Now, now I will confront directly. So the question is, can we read the world of nuclear weapons and make the world a safer place? We should try to read the world of nuclear weapons, but how can we do it where, while making the world a safer place is where I do not see an answer given by the TPW, TFP and W. In fact, when I talked to some of the negotiators, they said they don't care. They care only about the moral and ethical issues, which are valid, which are important. I don't wish to dismiss them. But unless we have an answer on how we provide security in the absence of nuclear weapons, the world will not rid itself of nuclear weapons, and so on. That does not completely answer the concern that Angela Kane had made. Will this propel others to acquire nuclear weapons? Is there a possibility there will be a nuclear arms race? Can we still have a nuclear war and so on? All of those are valid concerns. I don't wish to dismiss them even for a second. And clearly the asymmetry is something which, which is uh, uh, diplomatically and otherwise a, a concern, but I would argue that this would not drive further proliferation. The reason Iran has been subscribing to nuclear ambitions and had a, a, a plan to acquire nuclear weapons, the reason the DPRK holds on to them is because they feel security vulnerable and that the world sort of has not addressed their security predicament Iran harbors their ambitions back many, many years when they sort of to the periods of colonialism and so on. And the world stood idly by when they were attacked by chemical weapons. What worries me greatly about the prospects of nuclear proliferation are two things in particular, not the asymmetry. One is that the, the credibility of US security guarantees is waning, notwithstanding possession of nuclear weapons for reasons that I think some of you have already touched on. And frankly, if we do not see an urgent answer to the provocations of Iran via the Houthis against Saudi Arabia, I'm willing to put my money on the fact that we're gonna have a nuclear Saudi Arabia before long. The Americans are distancing themselves from Saudi Arabia for good reasons, Khashoggi assassination being just one of them. I'm willing to put my money on this going to happen and it's gonna happen quickly. It won't happen through uh, research, development, acquisition in the normal way that we have seen things. Just to give you one example. So one is the security guarantees and the credibility that is going through the window. The second one is that technological development are eroding the distinction between the, the capabilities that were necessary to produce chemical weapons, sort of nuclear weapons, conventional weapons, and, and so on, and that with regards to both the, the weapons themselves, the weapons technology, and the delivery vehicles. That is a very serious issue. So the ease of getting nuclear weapons, one of the most shocking revelations that came out of the Iran nuclear archive that Israel pulled out of Iran was how widespread the knowledge was and how much forward Iran was able to be based on information that was available in the public domain. But on the, on the flip side of it, when the knowledge is so available, why are so many countries not acquiring? And now I get to the final answer to you, uh, Professor Platias. The answer is very simple, because they could obtain security 
without having to acquire nuclear weapons. If that perception in the ROK, in Japan, in Saudi Arabia, in the UAE uh, is eroded, we're gonna get another spiral of nuclear weapons. The great success that we have had in non-proliferation was to convince countries that were on their path to acquiring nuclear weapons, Sweden, Italy, Argentina, Brazil, the list is more than 20 countries. Australia was that they could have security without nuclear weapons because there will be alternatives would be available to them and that the status of nuclear weapons possession isn't that important. So it brought us down to security considerations at the end of the day. What worries me is that the security considerations now are much more difficult uh, and may propel us in the opposite direction. Thank you very much, Eli. Uh, I would like now to turn to Vasily Stringas, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Zwartman College at Tsinghua University. So he will give us the view from China, I imagine. Vasily, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Marilena. Let me start uh, by thanking Professor Athanasius Platias and the Department of International and European Studies for this invitation. I'm very privileged to be here. We're talking about two of the most preeminent uh, experts and uh, scholars and practitioners of nuclear strategy, Angela Cain and Eli Levitt. Uh, and so the discussion up until now has been mostly focused on horizontal proliferation. And I would like to bring in the topic of vertical uh, proliferation, which Angela touched, uh, touched upon a little bit. And so for the past couple of years, there is this very fervent debate within the Chinese strategic community. On the one hand, we have Hu Xijin, who is the chief editor of the Global Times, which is basically a very patriotic newspaper, the mouthpiece of the party, uh, whose argument goes like that. It's, there is no way back to good China-US relations. Um, the way forward will be more competitive, if not an outright rivalry between Washington and Beijing. And that means that nuclear parity or even nuclear superiority matters if there is a crisis in the South China Sea or the Taiwan Straits. And so his suggestion to the government is that China who substantially increase both its numbers of ICBMs, but also its qualitative capabilities by building a fully fledged nuclear triad. Now, on the other hand, we have our good friend, Professor Li Bin at Tsinghua University, who basically says that China does not need nuclear parity with the United States. China has a non-first use policy. Therefore, there is no need for a counter, uh, a counter force strike. That means there's no need for numerous ICBMs. And at the same time, China only has a declared policy of assured retaliation. So they only need a sufficient number to retaliate if they are attacked. And so his argument is that if China increases its nuclear arsenal by about you know, 50, 100%, that would be sufficient to keep the nuclear balance, the strategic balance between China and the United States. And so my question here to both Ellie and Angela is why is it the case that the Chinese pursue a very different strategy from the Soviet Union? Because the Soviet strategy after the Cuban Missile Crisis was one of nuclear parity or even nuclear superiority. And so the puzzle is that is it something that strategic culture can explain? Or is it the case that the competition, the level of competition, the level of rivalry night right now between China and the United States is nowhere near the level of rivalry that it was between the Soviet Union and the US in the 70s and 80s, okay? So that's question number one. Why are the Chinese doing it differently? 
And question number two has to do a lot about technology and technological disruptions and surprise. Um, now, I know Professor Platias and Ellie studied at Cornell back in the 80s, and that was the period of the Strategic, Def uh, strategic Defense Initiative. Uh, and basically, back then, the argument was that, okay, the United States will soon develop ballistic defense uh, technologies, and that could affect the strategic balance. Now, we know in hindsight that the technologies back then were not mature. However, what, however, what we're seeing right now is that space-based assets and those 20 years of enormous spending from the United States on ballistic defense could perhaps lead to some degree of disruption within the next 10, 15 years. And this is something that the Chinese have mentioned time and over again when they negotiate with the Americans. Think about the THAAD radar in South Korea and the belief of the Chinese uh, that the defense capabilities, the ballistic defense capabilities of the Americans would be sufficient to basically um, um, neutralize the assured retaliatory, retaliatory capabilities of the United States. And so, the, so we have this ballistic technology which becomes more mature. And at the same time, we have the conventional prom striked technologies, this hyper, hyper um, uh, 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 sonic technologies that basically they can be used to attack command and control centers. And because they're conventional and super fast, it could be a case that you have a first strike which does not use nuclear capabilities, but only use conventional capabilities. Added to that, we have the precision revolution. So we know for a fact that the next generation, even the current generation of American ICBM systems are extremely precise. And, and that means they can be, you need less, uh, 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 you need a smaller counterforce to destroy the re retaliatory capability of your adversary. And so here's my question. We're talking about enormous technological complexity, which we, do we did not have back in the 80s. Ballistic defense maturity and space-based assets, conventional prom strike uh, capabilities and hypersonics, and increased precision. And I should also add artificial intelligence when it comes to the operational planning of a first strike. So how would those technological disrupt disruptions affect the strategic balance between the United States and China within the next 10, 15 years? So now I will be the bad guy. We have to wrap up at, uh, in about 10 minutes. So the difficult exercise for both of you is to answer this very complex question. Five minutes each, please. Uh, Angela, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I think those are very interesting questions. And actually, I touched upon a number of them because I said whoever controls the technology is going to win the battle or is going to win the war. And uh, and I agree what Eli sort of said and some of the questions he raised about the, the nuclear weapons. But I must tell you that I am not one to sort of say every nuclear weapon must be abolished right away. Let's all join the TPNW. We will not have nuclear weapons. But I really wonder about the utility of the nuclear weapons in some case. I accept the fact that yes, if you're under a nuclear uh, umbrella, uh, you feel secure. But you tell me, for example, why do the UK and France have nuclear weapons? Who are they gonna guard against? You know, I'm, that does not make any sense to me at all. And it would actually be a tremendous, uh, it's a prestige issue. And that is something that I think we are underestimating. The prestige of being the P5, even though the five, weapon, uh, the five nuclear weapon powers in the Security Council were there because of, they were the victors of the Second World War, not because of nuclear weapons. China only acquired nuclear weapons in 1964. But it is absolutely true that the technology and the difference between conventional and, 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 and nuclear gets wiped out if it really comes to a first strike. And that is something that's very important. I also must say that I agree that we're now at a threshold where we can say, who else is going to have nuclear weapons? And Saudi Arabia, I think, is one of the prime candidates, not only because of Iran, but also because, unfortunately, the U.S. has supported them because there's a so-called gold standard where they're not supposed to enrich their own uranium, but they're supposed to get it from the outside. They insisted on enrichment, and the U.S. basically agreed to that. 
The same is true for India, for example. India, the US very strongly supported to become a member of the nuclear suppliers group, which it shouldn't because the threshold is that uh, you have to be a member uh, of the NPT. And so that is something that has been resisted, particularly by China. But we are now at an inflection point because what does it mean to have strategic stability? Is it due to, let's say, nuclear umbrella, nuclear possession? It is not, in my opinion, but no one is looking at that. Who is negotiating? Outer space is in dire straits, conventional weapons, and they can also be, you know, missiles can also be loaded with, with nuclear weapons, for example. You don't know whether they have them or not. So no one is negotiating that. There are no negotiations, and there haven't been any negotiations for over a decade now. And that really worries me, because we need to look at these issues, because it depends also with China's rise to being at par level, at eye level with the United States, they need to be drawn into these negotiations. They cannot be just be left outside of it. And when it comes to North Korea, there's a major spoiler there because Trump has moved something. And I agree with him that he moved something with, with North Korea, but he's essentially, he has recognized North Korea as a nuclear power. And it's very hard to draw that back. And that brings it again to the issue of equanimity in terms of the non-proliferation treaty, treatment with Iran, for example, which did abide by the JCPOA until the US abrogated or stepped out of the treaty. So there are a lot of anomalies in this whole picture and no one is really pulling the threads together. And I fear that with Biden just having come into office, what, six weeks ago, it's very short time that he's expected to pull everything together and make it right again, because it won't happen that way. There has to be much more of a effort. And COVID isn't helping. The economy isn't helping in all of our countries. Back to you. Thank you very much, Angela, for, for staying uh, in the time frame. Ellie. Thank you. Um, I actually love this dialogue with Angela. Angela, thank you for putting things uh, so well on the table. So a couple of things where we agree, a couple of things we didn't agree, and I'll try to, to highlight both in, in the, for purposes of wrapping up the discussion, uh, at least from my perspective. I think that the, um, the central message that Angela was saying about the lack of arms control, at least dialogue, let, leave aside agreements, dialogue is a highly disconcerting aspect. I do not think that overall arms control fundamentally limited more than people were willing to limit themselves. What it did provide is an extraordinary important platform for enhancing strategic stability. And where it's missing, we're in jeopardy. The US Chinese case is very much in, in, in point. So when Angela was re lamenting the fact that there is no Chinese involvement in direct negotiations with the United States, whatever the platform is, that ultimately makes it possible to engage in strategic stability, one has to be quite concerned. Now, I will tie that with the question that was posed to us. The, the fundamental situation is that whereas the US had accepted the mutual assured destruction with Russia formally, it has never accepted it with respect to China. We can fault them, we can support them, but the situation is that what it is. Now, when superimposed on the reluctance of the United States to accept the mutual assured destruction relationship with China. And then there are the developments that you described on mutual defense, missile defense and conventional armaments and cyber, or in all of these areas, the United China being convinced that the United States has the superiority. And at the same time, there is a rising China that is doing, engaging in massive military modernization in scaling up the size of its nuclear arsenal uh, um, in projecting some of its capabilities in the East South China Sea, East China Sea, uh, intimidating Taiwan and so on, we're clearly in a very, very uh, uh, delicate and worrisome situation where the two parties are not talking about strategic stability. Now, how can we develop a more mature culture where the Americans would be willing to engage in strategic stability alongside strong competition with China? but nevertheless find a way of modicum of cooperation where the Chinese would feel that their peaceful rise doesn't have to manifest itself in the strong arm tactics that they are and so on, that is going to be the biggest challenge in front of us in the coming years. More important than any of the others that we're currently facing, I would submit. 
Uh, we have been doing some quiet stuff. I'm not, com I don't, wouldn't com completely despair, but I think the challenges in front of us and where Biden could make a big difference is I think there and notwithstanding congressional pressures, political constraints, uh, I don't know how many terms he will serve uh, uh, and so on. You're right. The explanation about the size of the arsenal has to do with strategic culture, has to do with, strategic, with other realities and so on. But do we find it more reassuring that China now builds such a, a capability uh, to engage in, in, in uh, conventional missile and so on, not just for area denial and access denial, but also for uh, uh, purposes of, of um, putting its weight against some of its neighbors in, in, the, in Asia? Not particularly stabilizing. Yes, Angela is right, space is the new frontier. Now you have to ask yourself, if warfare on space, in space, and form space is what would, would make humanity a better place. If you don't think so, you should ask yourself, why do certain, certain countries are committed to engage in all of these activities and to try and regain hegemony or to deny hegemony of those who are operating in space? I, I am very much more worried, frankly, about the prospects of things happening wrong as a result of space than of nuclear, not because I belittle the nuclear threat, but I think the magnitude of, the, 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 of getting it wrong ultimately serves as a deterrence. Don't take this as a recipe to spread nuclear weapons, to increase their arsenals, or to hold back from, from cutting back on arsenals or sliding backwards and getting more uh, serious commitments out of the nuclear states. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellie. Uh, we, we have to end the discussion. It was really fascinating. Thank you very much, Ellie, Angela, uh, Athanasius and uh, Vasily for your comments that helped a lot uh, further develop the discussion. I hope there will be a, other occasions uh, to have uh, such high quality discussions. So really, thank you very much. Now a message for our Greek friends. I'll uh, turn to Greek. Um, στις 12 Μαρτίου έχουμε μία συζήτηση στο Συμβούλιο των uh, Διεθνών Σχέσεων uh, για την Ελληνική Υψηλή Στρατηγική και την Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση με τον Αντιπρόεδρο της Ευρωπαϊκής Επιτροπής, τον Μαργαρίτη Σχοινά. 12 Μαρτίου, λοιπόν, uh, στις 6 και μισή, uh, κεντρικός ομιλητής ο Μαργαρίτης Σχοινάς, χαιρετισμό του Κωνσταντίνου Αρβανιτόπουλου από το Tufts University, και σχολιάζουν ε, οι καθηγητές Κωνσταντίνα Μπότσιου, Χρήστος Χατζιεμανουήλ και Φωτεινή Ασδεράκη. Συντονισμός, mm. πα, ε, ο Αριστοτέλης Τζιαμπύρης από το Πανεπιστήμιο του Πειραιά ε, και πρόεδρος του Διοικητικού Συμβουλίου του Συμβουλίου. Ε, ελπίζω να είστε όλοι εκεί. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ για την uh, συμμετοχή σας. So, Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Καληνύχτα. Ευχαριστώ πολύ.